Hey y'all. Uh, so you know that we've been doing a bunch of videos about space policy. There's a ton of preamble in the prior videos, so it's worth watching. Uh, if if this is your first uh, if you, if this is your first video with us, definitely take a look at the preamble videos. Uh, I'm going to jump straight into this. We have some uh, pretty cool stuff coming up next week, so definitely check it out. We're going to do some history, and there's a big update about lunar missions coming, so uh, stick with us. Uh, all right, so the, the third part of this five-set um, section of the new era policy that came out from Washington, D.C. a couple weeks ago uh, is really focused on Mars, and I know that that's you know, the big idea that drives a lot of people is Mars. So that it's in this document as a, a necessary step. They're doing it very specifically, low Earth orbit, establish that, go to the moon, establish that, go to Mars, establish that. So I, I like their their processes in here, the, the thinking behind it. Uh, Mars is definitely that destination that is powerfully romantic. Uh, we're going to use the demonstrations that we develop off the lunar surface to take us long term uh, to the Martian surface. So, you know, this idea that um, this long term human presence, both on the moon and Mars, that is astoundingly. We've had 20 years of the International Space Station. We've learned so much from that. I, it's hard for me to even imagine what we're gonna learn by having a long-term human presence on the moon and Mars. So pretty, pretty exciting days to, to, to look forward to. Um, I'm a little puzzled by this section. Uh, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna disguise that. Uh, if the main argument, uh, if the main argument for going to the moon is to figure out how to live off the land on the moon, uh, turn uh, ice into water and life support and fuel and, and everything else, if the main argument for going to the moon is to dig into the lunar surface and extract resources, and then you tell me, well, you can get a lot of those resources from the atmosphere of Mars. It does beg the question whether or not going to the moon is a necessary pit stop or if it is a distraction. Now, I definitely believe going to the moon is a necessary pit stop, but um, this argument here about extracting resources from the atmosphere does uh, call into question why we're going to the moon in the first place. So I just want to acknowledge that there's some um, uh, you know, different perspectives on this. Certainly, uh, Robert Zubrin uh, has been saying for a long time, just go straight to Mars. I believe recently he's been looking at uh, the Lagrange point as a refueling station as a way of expanding going to the moon, uh, going to Mars. But uh, I think that's a, a recent change. So I just think that this language is interesting because it acknowledges that there are other perspectives, but the federal government's main task is Leo, Moon, Mars. Uh, there are going to be breakthroughs that we learn by going to the moon long term. Uh, we're going to understand how to do extensive crew missions uh, better, right? So if, we're, if it's going to take two or three years without nuclear rockets, if it's going to take two or three years to do a, a Martian mission, we better spend two or three years doing a lunar mission so we know how to do those long duration missions. Um, uh, one of my classmates at International Space University, um, uh, Diego Urbana, he spent 500 days with, I think, five or six other guys in a box. It's called the Mars 500 program. It's definitely worth looking up. 
but they simulated what it would be like to do a 500-day mission to and from Mars. Uh, pretty impressive stuff, definitely worth looking into. The Mars 500 program was conducted, obviously, down here on Earth, but I have a strong suspicion that they're going to conduct a similar 500-day mission on the moon before they go to Mars. So uh, I think that that's going to teach us, you know, in situ resource utilization, manufacturing and assembly, and always one of the new ideas that's near and dear to my heart is this concept of uh, nuclear propulsion. Um, I'm excited. I'm going to be talking to one of the leaders, Dr. Adams, later this afternoon. So as I learn more, I'll, I'll share that with you. But uh, nuclear propulsion, Mars in a month, that's a pretty exciting idea. So um, and that changes everything. That changes everything. So um, we are going to focus on how to drastic re drastically reduce the cost and complexity of human missions. Uh, in... And I think that's the strongest argument for why we go to the moon in the first place. We're looking for success, we're looking for safety, and we're looking for sustainability. Um, a guy who wrote a really fascinating book, uh, Rand Simberg, uh, he wrote a book called Safe is Not an Option. And in Rand's book, he makes the argument, which I think is really interesting, uh, kind of compelling. He makes the argument that we put too much emphasis on safety and security. He doesn't talk about success and he doesn't talk about sustainability. He really focuses on safety, that the amount of effort that we put into making systems safe where failure is not an option, uh, he says safe, safe is not an option, that uh, the cost benefit ratio of this much time, this much expertise, this much cash versus the life of an astronaut, that equation doesn't balance and we put too much emphasis on safety. Now, I've come to understand that if my lunar elevator is successful, we're probably going to kill some people. And that's a horrible thing to carry. Uh, so it's one thing to write an academic book about, you know, ratios of, of how you analyze costs and, uh, versus human, human lives. Um, but to carry the burden of a human life is a very different situation. So uh, I like their language in here about increasing the likelihood of success, safety, and sustainability. I think the, the metrics for safety, success, and sustainability need to be really well understood. Uh, and we don't understand that just yet. So, um, uh, but this counter argument about how much is too safe, how much of investment is too much of an investment, um, I, I think it's an interesting conversation that needs to be uh, needs to be explored further. Um, so, what are the consequences of going? Going to the Mars, uh, going to Mars. Um, you know, we're gonna. Some of the stuff that we do on Mars is going to mirror what we did on the Moon, and I think the concept of robotic missions, which we've gotten quite good at, we've had a lot of time on Mars with robots, uh, but they've only. You know, literally and figuratively, they've only scratched the surface. They've only dug a little a little bit of a dip into the lunar, uh, into the Martian surface. Uh, and we've not gone very far on Mars in a, in a, you know, miles traveled, kilometers traveled perspective. So by just spending time on the moon, we will get better at being on Mars, at, at building out robotic missions and especially, especially pre-positioning resources. Uh, that's going to be the, the make or break solution to uh, you know, success on Mars. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm being mildly sarcastic here, but if anybody saw the movie The Martian, uh, 
Matt Damon got pretty dang lucky that we had pre-positioned assets on, on Mars. And I don't think that's entirely far-fetched that we should have emergency supply services and rations uh, around where we're going to put people out there. So, so pre-positioning, I think, uh, so far has not really been looked at at the depth that probably is necessary. So that's an area I really want to see. I'm glad to see this document uh, highlights that. I would like to see a greater emphasis on that because I think that's going to be the key to both lunar and Martian missions is having stuff that you know is already there that you know you can get to and access. So uh, fingers crossed on that. I'm, I'm actually kind of excited about that. I think that's one of the the magic bullets to make this whole program work. Um, even though the moon and, and Martian atmospheres are vastly, vastly, vastly different, the idea of pressurized rovers, uh, the experience of building a pressurized rover on the moon helps us make pressurized rovers on Mars better. Same thing with habitation modules. Uh, same thing with ascent vehicles, different circumstances, different gravities, different atmospheres. But in the end, what we learn from one, we can apply to the other. Uh, and always power generation. How do we generate the energy to make all of our systems work? Uh, we are not going to Mars and we are not going to the moon long term without absolutely perfectly reliable power generation systems but you know if, if you thought it was cool that we're going back to the to the moon to stay this present this this line about long-term presence on mars wow um that's that's something straight out of science fiction and it's it's amazing that that we as humanity are enacting those science fiction visions of the future. So um, I don't know what long-term presence on Mars means. Is that a normal mission that takes two years, eight months to get there, eight months to come back, and then you've got some time on the surface? Um, does that constitute long-term presence on Mars? To me, it doesn't. To me, long-term presence on Mars is hundreds if not thousands of people living, working, and playing on Mars. So I think that that's the goal that we're aiming for. I would have liked this pivotal document, this, this national policy, to spell out what long-term presence on Mars means as a, as a target, as a goal. I think as an aspirational target, that would be something really powerful and that that would drive a really powerful and important conversation. So I, I would have liked some more language on that, but it, it does make me really happy when they talk about long-term presence on Mars. Um, this one, uh, Every bit of this matters, every bit of this sentence. Uh, the United States can establish a long-term hum human presence on the Martian surface. It will have demonstrated the technology and expertise to begin to explore other destinations safely. Uh, I gotta tell you, this, this line surprised me. Um, I don't really understand what this line means, but it might mean exploring asteroids. It might mean developing a presence, a human presence on Venus. Like I don't really, uh, in, the, in the atmosphere, not, not on the surface, um, I don't really know what this line means, but I think what it says is if we get good at Mars, if we are obviously good at the moon because we had to be there first, what other options are available? So I think this is a visionary statement. I, I would love to have some more clarity. I'm curious to see what kind of policies are derived from this core document. Um, we're going to go out into the solar system. We're going to use Moon and Luna and, and Mars as bases to move beyond that, right? That they're, they're gonna be staging points to move beyond. We're gonna use resources that we find uh, and we're gonna go with our like-minded countries, our partners, to peaceful, peacefully explore and develop the solar system. 
peacefully and explore peacefully explore and develop the solar system. So this is not about the moon and Mars anymore. It's about going out further and permanently securing American interests and values. That's pretty powerful. Um, is this saber rattling? Is this uh, is this a challenge to our near peer adversary nations? I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I'm I, once again. I'm I'm continually curious about who the authors of this document are and what messages they were trying to uh, send out to uh, to other nations. So, uh, of course, this document references is for and is about the United States, but it also sends a message out to the rest of the nations of the world. So this line I think is particularly interesting. Permanently secure American interests and values in space. Peacefully explore and develop the solar system. Those are, those are evocatively powerful and I'm, I'm curious how it resonates with other people. All right, so this is our this is our third video for the day. So we're going to wrap this up. We've got two more sections for this uh, this ambitious strategy portion of the new era document. So we're almost done. Hang in there. Really glad that you're sticking with us on this. Thanks. Uh, if this is one of those things that actually is interesting to you, there's a good chance that you've got other friends, maybe two other two other friends that are also interested in this. Please. Like, share, subscribe, and tell two friends. All right. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye-bye.